Well, it's good to see you today, and I am looking forward to uh, sharing with all of us a a lesson series that helps us with the things that we struggle with the most. And one of those things that are our biggest problem areas and struggle areas are relationships, especially when we know that whatever the relationship challenge is, the one thing that will make it better is forgiveness. There is where we are going to struggle. And at this uh, lesson series, or at least today, at least this lesson today, is if it's going to work for you, I need you to remember something, something that we discussed thoroughly in the last lesson series on the beginning. I want you to keep in mind the fall. That's kind of the the theological term of the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden when they did the opposite of what God uh, commanded uh, that they do. And if you recall the fall about Adam and Eve in the beginning, what it did was derail the relationship that they had with their father, God. Now, in the garden, we don't have too much uh, about the interaction um, except for one place where God uh, and, and uh, God and Adam uh, discuss uh, the naming of the animals and, and things surrounding that. But we have this picture of God walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. It shows a very personal, close relationship that God had with the people that he created uh, in his image. Now, when we remember this, I just want you to know that when Adam and Eve sinned and did what God said, do not do, in chapter 2 and verse 17, he told them, or told Adam, uh, that you are not allowed to, to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that is exactly what they did. And when they did this, they sinned and they died. Now, they didn't die physically, obviously. Adam lived uh, another 900 plus years, depending on when that event took place. And it is clear that they died spiritually. But what happened to the relationship is what I want us to see. That that relationship of walking in that beautiful way with God was over. It was over for them. because That was the price that they paid for that sin. The thing about sin is, and I think we don't think about it the way that we need to. Uh, we need to think about it more. We need to think about what sin does, what their sin did to them, and and what our sin does to us. Sin separates us from God. And with that uh, being the the nature of, uh, of sin and the consequences, we need to remember that when we are separated from God, they were, and we will, and we are too, they were, they were separated and they lost the most important thing in their life. And that was that close relationship with God. My friends, that right there should be the most important thing to us. Our relationship with God. Because God's solution, when we derail any relationship, whether it's you and I or between spouses or with friends or family or whatever it is, when relationships are derailed, when they go off track, that God's solution was, is, and always will be forgiveness. God forgiving sinners and sinners forgiving other sinners. That is God's solution. And so in this study uh, uh, for, for November, in this study about how God gives us real solutions, real solutions about the, the relational issues that you and I deal with for the broken relationships that we suffer from, we must begin with the biblical premise that sin is a life and relationship killer. It's what it does. And it does it very well. It does it very harshly. And we suffer from all of this. Sin is a life and relationship destroyer. Sin separates. Sin divides. 
Sin derails, sin hurts, and sin can even kill. And that is the harshest reality of all. Do you realize that sin, because of sin, we stand to lose everything. Everything that's truly important. Everything that uh, God wants us to have. And so our first lesson that we, we will look at in trying to, to understand God's solutions for derailed, broken era- uh, relationships is how do we get our life with God back on track? Now that presumes some things, doesn't it? Number one, that a person's relationship with God can be derailed. And it most certainly can. But we also have to see that, that uh, uh, when we study this, we also have to understand that it is possible to be on track again with God. To be back where you need to be. And God wants you there. Now when we start to look at this, I want you to look at Luke 15. I'm going to make it very easy on you today. All you need is a Bible. You're not going to flip to any other places. I promise. You're going to be in Luke 15 and Luke 15 alone. And we are going to start in verse 11. The first thing we are going to notice in trying to understand this very important parable uh, or spiritual story about, uh, about a young man, a story that Jesus told in Luke 15... I want you to understand that God's forgiveness means you can have your life back. I don't know where we got off track in this understanding that God will forgive you, but He won't really give you much of a life after that. That is not what the Bible teaches. You get it all back when God forgives. And so listen to this uh, as this wonderful passage unfolds. A parable of Jesus. Verses 11 through 16. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. Let's stop there for a minute. This spiritual story is about a young man who before it was the right time asked to have his portion of his father's estate given to him. So what the father did, we don't read anything about the discussion or the trying to talk him out of it or whatever. The father divided his inheritance with his two sons. It should have been um, at or at least near the time of his death. And so in this spiritual story about this young man uh, who took his blessings, he took the blessings or the inheritance that his father gave him, and then he walked away and left his father and left his family as well to live a foolish and also a sinful life. Now, my friends, I want to give you the meaning of the parable before. It's about being lost and then being found. And Jesus, it's just, a, it's just one of three uh, parables in this section that Jesus wants His listeners to know that God is always searching and that you can always be found. But the point of this one is about you and I. It is about us. About sinful people like you and me. This parable is about what can happen when a relationship with God gets off track, when we derail the relationship that we have with God. And when that happens, good things don't usually come from it. You know, it's very clear 
uh, in this as Jesus unfolded the first part of this young man walking away from his father, walking away from his brother, from his house, from his home, uh, from his relationships. It didn't take long for the man to figure out that derailing his relationship with his father and family doesn't bring the kind of life that he thought it would. Man, I just want to get out of here. I just want to be on my own. I want to do my own thing. I'm tired of the rules. I'm tired of being told what to do. I'm tired of being my father's slave. Now, when you think about this, I don't know, maybe you can picture yourself. I remember. I remember, I mean, not to this extent, but I remember the desire to be on my own, do my own thing, be my own boss, as it were. It's no different for this young man. All he gained, though, was misery. All he gained was a miserable life. He ended up in poverty. He once enjoyed the great blessings of living with his father, but now he was just simply miserable. Now, I also want you to notice something. Notice how alone he was how lonesome he would have been, even with people around. But later he found himself all alone. The people he was partying with, uh, they were not his people. With these people, there was no love. There was no friendship. Nobody loved him. Nobody cared about him. No one was willing to help him. And that simply shows us in Jesus' own simple story that the world is not our answer. The world is not where we can be at home. The world is not where we can find anything like we can find with a close relationship with God and living with God's family. The world cannot compare. And this man found out. This young man found out. And so what then is God's solution to this? If this is about us and about how we can do the very same thing, derail our relationship with God, take what we've got and just go out and just do our own thing and live our own way. What is God's solution? Now you would think we would say it begins with God or it begins with the Father, but that's not the way the the story, the way Jesus tells it unfolds. It doesn't begin with God. It begins with me. It begins with you. Notice what the text says now. Look at verse 17. All right, remember what what state he's in? He's eating the pig food. No one wants to help him. Everybody bails on him. No one will give him anything. And this is what he thought. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. Now every bit of that's going on in his head. He's not saying it yet. Now, all that is in his head. That's what he is thinking about. Now, what we're seeing here is that true repentance is God's solution at this point. True repentance. The changing of one's mind. The changing of the direction of a person's life. It does not begin with God. It begins with us. Our decision. And so he says, uh, uh, well, we'll look at it in a second. I want you to think about maybe our, uh, you know, how we look at ourselves first. For this parable to be meaningful, we have to look at it uh, in relationship to our lives, either where they've been, where they are now, where, you, uh, where they need to be perhaps because they're not there uh, in some way. Maybe we need to ask ourselves questions like, where am I living? Am I living close to God and living close to His family? Am I with uh, God and His family in body, but not really in spirit? Maybe we have to ask ourselves, what is keeping me from a close relationship with God? And what is keeping me from a close relationship with this family? Maybe it is sin. Real sin, just sin. Maybe 
It's just you're too busy or you think you might be too busy. Maybe you can be like anyone can be in their life, uh, lazy physically or just spiritually lazy. Maybe you're discouraged and maybe you've been hurt and maybe you have no desire to even do it Maybe you've simply just lost your spiritual focus. Things are just kind of askew in your, in your life at this particular time. The big question is, what do I do to get my life with God back on track? What do I do? We do exactly what this young man apparently did and, and was willing to do and then did. The first thing is to return to proper thinking. This man had to swallow his pride. He had to acknowledge that life with his father is better than any life he could have experienced by taking all his stuff and his money and going out on his own and doing it himself. He returned to proper thinking, something that he knew was right, something that he knew would be better. And he came to his senses, the text says, It is also about making up one's mind to go back to God. He says, I know what I'll do. I will get up from here and I'll go back to my father even if I have to be a servant or to to be a hired worker. So it is about making up one's mind to go back to God. Making up your mind. Which means do it. Make the decision. No delays. Uh, No more excuses. But then it gets a little harder. It's one thing to want to and to think that would be much better, but now the hard stuff comes. Confessing sin. Confessing sin is the acknowledgement that we were wrong, that we were foolish, that we were sinful. We can't blame God. We can't blame people. We can't blame anybody else. The, The thought of His wild living, the way the NIV relates it, the thought of His wild living meant that He would have needed to confess sin and know that He was not living the right way. What else? Being humble. Can you imagine a person in more humble circumstances than going out to feed the pigs and being so hungry? that all I have to eat is the pig food because no one else will help me. I mean, where's all your friends now? They have nothing to give themselves, apparently. We need to be humble. And what that means is we have to have a proper view of God and a proper view of ourself. God's righteousness, our unrighteousness, God's glory and how rather uh, uh, not glorious uh, we are. It is the willingness to give in to God and to give over to God and to be desirous of living by His will once again. But the most important thing that we can ever do when we find ourselves uh, with our life off track, not with God the way that we need to be, and if we really are to make repentance be true repentance, is that we must follow through. Do it. We can think about it. Oh, and we can pray for it. And we can wait for the golden time when everything is perfect and everything lines up. Or we can just do it. Follow through. Which means, like this young man, make the decision, get up and go home and make things right with the Father. That's God's solution. The solution is for us to repent and to change, and to desire and fulfill going back to the Father. Now, the reason that this is important, folks, is that God has something for us, something He wants to give us so badly. God wants to restore us. Restore us. Restoration. To bring us back and make everything the way it needs to be. This is where only God can do that. This is where God does His work. God does through His Son. Restoration is God's blessing to restore us to relationship and family. Look at verse 20, chapter 15, and the following sentence. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. 
The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now when you start to think about this this, uh, part of the story and what uh, reconciliation means... I think we have to suppose a little bit. At least it's helpful for me. I wonder if that young man expected the the response and the welcome back that he was given. I wonder if he was just overwhelmed by surprise. I didn't think it was going to be that good. I didn't think it was going to be that easy. I didn't even think, maybe he was thinking God uh, or the, the Father may not even let him come home. Let him even come in the house. But that's not the kind of father this young man has. It's not the kind of God that we have either. The father's response uh, was probably a total surprise to this young man. You know, it's, it's one of the saddest things in life that many think that God does not want them back. Now, how do you get information like that? From the Bible? No. The only way that you can get that, I guess, is in two ways. You can think it, because of your emotions or or guilt or or whatever it is, or regrets, or you get it from somebody else. My friends, we just need to stay with what this view uh, of God is about this Father. God the Father received Him back. He received Him back as a beloved son. He received him back to the, to, as, the, as the, the young man that he was, his son and his heir. There's nothing in this text about having to fix everything that you messed up or pay back everything you blew or to do what many people say, you got to do penance, like a little bit of earthly torture until heaven. Because you can't be happy anymore, you got to be miserable. You think I'm kidding? I bet I'm talking about 90% of the believer's world right there. My friends, we have to see God for who He is. The Father was still proud of Him. The Father uh, took His Son and welcomed Him home. And it was worth celebrating. You see, that's what restoration is. That's what it's like to be restored into a relationship that by our sin, we are derailed in our relationship with God. What is restoration? Restoration is a repentant, turned around, sinner's full, complete, forgiven, and forgotten. Welcome back into the family of God. That is what restoration is. That is what we want. You know why this works? Because this is God's nature. This is the kind of God we love, and this is the kind of God that loves us as well. Now i got to kind of put the brakes on that. Unfortunately, <clears throat> this is not necessarily the family's nature. And if you've ever experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. This may be the way our father is, but the children often are not as gracious and, and good and accommodating and forgiving and loving and kind as our incredibly awesome father uh, is and has shown himself to be. Because not only does God want to to restore us to His wonderful blessings, not only is that important, but God wants us to be reconciled, to come back together in relationship. It's more than just to be recognized as a child again or a son again. It's about to come back and live together again. And be reconciled in the relationship. Reconciliation is God's goal. And sometimes we, and when I say we, I mean we. We often resist this part for some reason. Look at verse 25. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. What was he doing out there? Working. He didn't go anywhere, did he? He came near the house 
or when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf with him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything that I have is yours. Is there any doubt, folks, that God is a very good forgiver, that He's the best forgiver, that with God, forgiveness is His nature, it is His way, He doesn't struggle with it the way that we often struggle with uh, uh, with, uh, forgiveness. God is such a good forgiver, but we as God's forgiven children, we are not quite as good at forgiving as God is. Now I'm going to stop here for a second and say, now let's cut ourselves a little bit of slack. Because God knows everything. He knows what's going on in our hearts, what's going on in lives. He has this great desire. It is a part of His deity nature to be that gracious, kind, merciful, and forgiving. And with our limitations of flesh and our sinful off and on state, our up and down hot and cold lives, of course we are going to struggle with it, whereas God does not. But we have to understand that the people we are closest to can struggle with our repentance and they can struggle with the idea of God restoring us back to the way that we were in God's sight and in the sight of people. We have to understand that. Why is it? As people and say the family of God or our families at home, we can be bitter. After all, we haven't left God. We've always been here. We didn't go you know, uh, live a life of wild living. We didn't do that. And we start to look for the differences. Families can resent God's blessings to sinners while we forget that we are blessed sinners ourselves. Now ask me how that works. I don't know, but we just do that. That is to our shame. The family, and you see the example here, that the family, that this brother might even refuse to recognize God's forgiveness and say, you don't know, you are not forgiven or refused uh, to reconcile with you when you've been restored or reconciled to God. Well, God may have forgiven you, but I'm not. Oh, you can hang out with God, but we're not. You see, I'm trying to get you to understand why we need to keep our life with God uh, on track especially when it's derailed, because we can take glory. I mean, we can just give God the glory for what he has done for us so that later when we deal with the person-to-person issues of this very same subject, we can remember what we have been given. This is why this has to be the first lesson. This has to be just fully uh, uh, put into, uh, into our minds. And so if a sinner desires to get their life back, and get back on track with God, and back on track with family, what do we need to do, or what needs to be done? First, we need to repent. We need to stop. Come to our senses. Turn around and go home to go back with the Father. We need the restoration of God. We want the welcome back and pulling back into the family of God. And we also need to be reconciled to become uh, in the, the relationship again with God and God's other children in the family. Now, when we receive this, my friends, you know what this is? Because this is something that we all need. A fresh start. The fresh start. If you're a golfer, it's a mulligan. You know, if, it's, uh, if you're uh, in football, it's overtime. you still got life. It's, it's, just, it's just a fresh start in life. We need this from God. And this is what God wants to give us. Look at verse 32. This is the father speaking still to the, to the angry son. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours 
was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. My friends, God gives us what we truly need. And that is a fresh start. You know, at what the Father gave His repentant Son is something that we all desperately need in our life. Sometimes daily, sometimes right now, depending on who you are, and it'll probably be a time or two in your life later on. But in this closing statement of Jesus' parable, it is very easy to miss a very important lesson where the Father says, where God says, we had to celebrate. Had to. You know, so you know what the, the text, the, 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 the original language, uh, language um, says here? It's very interesting. When it says we had to, our Bibles did a very good job uh, 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 translating this. It means it was necessary to celebrate. I love that. It was appropriate to celebrate. It was the right thing to do. What does God always do? The right thing. Always does the right thing for us. And that's where we step up. That's where we step up and do the right thing as our Father does for us. We need to remember that many people who walk away from the Lord or walk away from the church or walk away from His Word or walk away from holy living or stay in the church building and always be here, but their minds or hearts are a million miles away, whatever, it is a picture of what we do. That many people fail to return to God because they think their life with God is over and it can never be brought back to the place and the way that it used to be. How do you think Jesus feels? Jesus doesn't have that uh, understanding of the love, restoration, and reconciliation and forgiveness of His Father in heaven. God always takes us back when we repent. Always. He will always receive us home. Now there's another reason why some will not come home. They won't come home simply because they think their family doesn't want them to come home, that they are not welcome back uh, in the family. And so our hard work as God's children is to work harder than we ever have to change our attitudes and, and align our minds and thinking and view of people, repentant people, with the view of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. We need to be like our Father in this instance now, don't we? This is one of the hard things that we will have to do. And so if your relationship with God, and I want you to start thinking about it now, if your relationship with God has been derailed, your Father wants you to come home. And His family wants you to come home as well. We may not act like it enough, but please be patient with us as we try to be like our wonderful Father in heaven. This sermon was intended, first of all, for those who are not in the body of Christ, those who are unsaved, that hold on to their sins and the eternal consequences of their sins. This sermon was intended for you to understand that God our Father wants to forgive you and save you. He made everything right in sending His Son so that those sins can be wiped out, atoned for, covered up, forgiven, completely forgo uh, forgotten so that you can live with God in His family. This lesson is for you. My friends, it is necessary and appropriate for you to know that the way to receive this forgiveness of God is Jesus has to be the Lord of your life. You need to believe in Him. But you have to learn about Him first so that you can confess His name. Jesus is Lord. Confess your sins and have your sins cleansed, washed away, uh, being immersed in baptism to receive God's precious Holy Spirit. This lesson is for you. That's what God wants to do for you. The lesson is also, though, for those who have been saved by Christ, but have wandered away from God and wandered away from the family. You might have derailed your relationship with God in this church, but God and His family 
want the same thing for you, wants you to come home, wants you to be home, to be with God and be with the family. What do you need to do? You need to repent, make the decision, and follow through with coming back to your Father who wants you back in the house. Not church house, but the church house is a part of it. To be back with the Father and with His children. Come home. You will find the grace of God. And you will find the grace of your brothers and sisters as well. There's an invitation for you to be with God. And uh, I want to give you that invitation to take advantage of this right now. While we stand and sing the song, you're invited to come forward to me.